Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Clarence Jordan begins his book, The Sermon on the Mount, with these words, Crowds always moved Jesus. Sometimes he was moved to great compassion by the crowds. At other times their disbelief aroused his pity. And sometimes their selfishness caused him to wonder if they were following him only for loaves and fishes. Their sickness and illness gnawed at his heart and their lostness and confusion filled him with a desire to show them the way to a true way of life. The quote ends there, but the thought continues. One day, as Jesus looked on the crowd, he saw that something was different. They were ordinary people, but this was not an ordinary crowd. They were all aware that the world was crashing down on them, they were aware that their lives and their civilization was sick unto death. They had reached the end of their rope. Following the example of John the baptizer, they had climbed down into the muddy Jordan River, into the stream of flowing living water, and there admitted their wrongdoings and all their failings, and they had repented of their sins. They rose refreshed and ready for a new way of life the Romans breathing down their necks and the stale air of oppression, the crowd turned to face the rabbi of Nazareth, a wonder worker, a healer, a teacher. It was on this day that Jesus offered his healing presence and his transformational word. Luke records this day in the sixth chapter of his gospel. Here Jesus, seeing the crowds and the multitudes before him, knowing the moment is at hand, does and then says what needs to be done and what needs to be said. This is very interesting because in Judaism, rabbis are taught the most important thing to do as a rabbi is to do, is to do what is right and just. And then if you get around to saying something about it, so be it. But doing always leads sayings in Hebrew scripture. So first, he heals everybody. Not one or two with well-known afflictions or easily diagnosed illnesses. He heals everybody. For the child who has struggled with stuttering, Jesus heals him. For the child who has experienced high anxiety with all the pressures of growing up, Jesus heals her. For the teenager struggling with relationships, Jesus listens and then heals her. For the shepherd who's contracted anthrax while caring for a dying sheep, Jesus heals him. For the woman who has been beaten down by life, carrying the load of her family for economic and familial survival, Jesus heals her. If you come to Jesus with any condition of mental illness, he heals you. If you come to him with pain in your neck or an ache in your side, he heals you. If you come with a broken leg or a broken heart or a broken moral code, he heals you. If you come with a finger out of joint or an attitude that needs major readjustment, he heals you. If you come with cancer or heart disease, he heals you. He is a therapist. He's a chiropractor. He's a general practitioner. He's a surgeon. He's a rabbi. All rolled into one. It might be impossible for us to believe this, but the text is very clear here. He heals everyone. And this is not the only place in Scripture where Jesus heals everyone. It happens seven times across the Gospels. Carte blanche, healing everyone. Now, I can imagine Jesus with the crowds that day for hours and hours before he delivered his blessings, his four blessings and four woes. 
For anyone who's a doctor in the house, you know that you spend hours and hours with people bringing about their healing. I can see the blind man reaching for him. I can see the child bringing his cut finger to Jesus for a healing kiss. I can see the tormented and the not so tormented just needing to know that someone will receive them, that someone will listen to them, and someone will accept them in their pain. Jesus treats the whole person because he loves the whole person. He knows that people are incredibly complex. He treats people for the complex beings that we are. He loves us for our quirks and our tics. He loves us for our phobias and our idiosyncratic ways. He, he loves us in spite of the fact that we talk too much or maybe too little. He loves our conscious and unconscious being. In the midst of everything about us, he believes that there are spiritual powers at play in our lives and in this universe that affect us. It affects us spiritually and psychologically and physically. And he takes this all very seriously. He is serious about our needs and about healing us. Through the years, I have seen time and time again People will tell and retell their stories of struggle until they feel like someone has finally heard them. They will come back to a doctor or a pastor with aches and pains, both of the body and the mind, that pills can't help. They just want to know that their pastor or their doctor is listening to them. Now, I can't speak for the doctors, but I can speak for myself. There have been times when I've listened carefully and been a part of a healing process. And there have been times when I have not listened carefully and thus prolonged the pain. Jesus, though, is unrelenting in his healing presence. He never gives up. He never gives in. He heals everybody. There's something else you need to know. After he has healed everyone, only then does he begin teaching. Now, his teaching in the Gospel of Luke is really interesting. It's only 166 words, based on which translation you're using. <laughs> he must have been worn out from all the healing he'd been doing with everybody because he stepped into their pain and received it all before letting it go to God. But he only had a few words to share after all that. And some of you are wishing that I was more like Jesus right now, I'm sure. While his healing of the disciples and the multitudes is prodigious, his words are simple and powerful bombshells. They were spoken to people who had been healed. They were listening carefully now to the man who had lifted the world's burdens from their lives. He had blessed the poor and brought them into his arms, into his fold. He had brought woe to the rich. The people whom Jesus called happy, the world was busy calling wretched the wretched of the earth. He turned the world upside down, but he does it in an interesting way. To the rich, he declares, it is the material values that you cherish. Now you have everything you need, and that's it. It's over. It's done. I can't do anything more for you. He doesn't damn someone for that wealth. He points out that they lose something by not having what's more to gain in this world, the fullness of life. However, if you set your heart and bend your energy to be loyal to God, you'll find real happiness and fulfillment. It is the joy that he shares that's an eternal value with only 166 words. He wants people to know what will make them happy and what will bring them down. The poor will be satisfied, the hungry will be filled, those who are weeping will be comforted, and if by chance you are hated and insulted and shut off by others who seek to do you harm, you will be rewarded with riches in heaven, just like the prophets who came before you. However, if you are rich now, filled up now, laughing now, and being exalted by people now who are really exalting false prophets, the tables will turn. In the words of the message from Eugene Peterson's writing, there is trouble ahead. He writes in Luke 6:24, if it's trouble ahead, you think, 
you have it made. But, but if it's trouble ahead, if you think you have it made, what you have, you'll just have to settle with as the end. And if it's trouble ahead, if you're satisfied with yourself, yourself will not be satisfied with you for long. And if it's trouble ahead, if you think that life's all fun and games, there's suffering to be met, and you're going, and you're going to have to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live for only the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look here, many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To follow Jesus is a true blessing, but it is not a blessing with life cho without life choices and consequences. If you follow these words, you'll know what I say. F.R. Maltby writes, Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, that they would be absurdly happy, and that they would be in constant trouble. One of Christianity's greatest blessings himself, G.K. Chesterton wrote of the times that he got in plenty of trouble. He says, I like getting into hot water because when you're in hot water, you get clean. Well, well said. Or as John Lewis would tell us, get into good trouble, right? In the end, the consequence of Jesus' healing everyone is that everyone gets clear enough and cleansed enough to make good choices about the way to live in this world. It's a wonderful consequence to have. And in the end, you and I can't ask for lives that are free of problems. We can't ask God to make us and those we love immune to diseases. We can't ask God to weave a magic spell around us so that bad things never touch our lives or come our way. But we can ask God for courage and for strength to bear the unbearable. We can ask God for the grace to remember the blessings of this life and those who blessed us and have gone before us. We can ask God to help us discover more strength and more courage than we ever knew we had. We cannot escape suffering, but we can find God in spite of it and even within it. This day, May we all pray for Jesus' healing. May we trust Jesus to heal us. And may we ask God to teach us to be strong enough to find a moment in this day when our heart is light enough to let us smile. And may we ask God, even in affliction, for the grace of God's loving spirit, which allows us to feel God's blessings today and rest in such a way tonight that we will rise filled with a blessing tomorrow for a new day. Amen.